My name is Ahmed Khalidi. I am Palestinian uh, from Jerusalem. My family is from Jerusalem. We trace our origins back to about a thousand years. Uh, the Nasebis claim to have been there before us, but they have no proof of that. Um, and I have uh, grown up in the diaspora. I'm currently based in England. I've been uh, active in Palestinian politics uh, for about uh, 500 years. Um, mostly in official and unofficial peacemaking and with great success, as you can see from today's panel. <laughs> I wish to thank uh, Tom and Omar and the Middle East Policy Council for bringing me over at no, uh, no little expense. I hope they find uh, it worthwhile. H how, how can we characterize the Middle East today? Fundamentally, uh, it's, there is a rampant regional civil war across the Levant, from Lebanon's shores to the Iraqi-Iranian borders. Now it has taken on a substantially sectarian character, Sunni Shiite, with multiple underlays. Here and elsewhere in the region, there are ethnic, economic, uh, factors, regional power struggles, historical rivalries, personal animosities, grand power politics, generational transitions, youthful frustrations, all of these have created a maze of interconnected overlapping conflicts and fault lines. Out of this turmoil, we have had new borders and new identities. In southern Sudan, there's a new state. In Syria, there's any number of statelets. Iraq has broken apart. Libya is polarized. Yemen is likely to go the same way. And the map, as has been now widely recognized, is changing shape, and its geopolitical permutations remain unpredictable. Will there be a new Kurdish state, for instance? Will new tribal and confessional entities redraw the region along more or less stable lines? Will the collapse into more primordial and less heterogeneous policies, or polities rather, ultimately bring peace and coexistence? Or will the forcibly cleansed ethnic tribal or confessional entities that are emerging remain in perpetual conflict and competition? Will they be at least as much a source of chronic instability as their predecessors? We've already seen the tide of shifting, competing axes and alignments come and go. Alliances and forces appear and wither. Yesterday's Muslim Brotherhood, which seemed to be sweeping through the region, is now being swept out of power, apparently in relentless retreat. New powers have emerged, dominated, and then receded. Qatar, yesterday's master of the region, today has shrunk back into its football stadiums. Old players appear to be on the verge of extinction, only to prove a confounding survivability and sustaining power, our good friend, President Assad of Syria. Where is the Palestinian-Israeli conflict in all of this? Certainly, it's not the most visible. And compared to the rest, it is in a pacific moment, a relatively bloodless one, thank God. But Visibility should not be confused with saliency. The Palestine-Israel conflict, amongst other things, is the point of convergence and intersection between almost all the elements that I have mentioned above. Borders, ethnicities, identities, religion, nationalism, all come together here on this ground. Its relative insulation from what is around it today is no indication of its incendiary potential, 
as we have witnessed before on many occasions. And furthermore, it is of global resonance. It is not a local affair, partly as a consequence of its history and the historicity of its place and its players, and partly because Israel is integral to the US political fabric, as is Palestine to the political and moral consciousness of millions around the globe. When the US wants to go to war in and around the region, it is Israel that is evo invoked for better or for worse. When protesters mass in Tehran, Ahmedabad, against Western injustice, real or perceived, Palestine is still a genuine rallying call. Will a Palestine-Israel solution address everything and resolve all these conflicts in the region? Of course not. No, no fool would say so, not even this one. Will it help to create a stable zone in a sea of turmoil? Most probably yes. Will its perpetuation as an open sore help to make the world a better place? Undoubtedly not. This, I think, very simply, is the very basic calculus of the United States today. <coughs> it is also the calculus of Israel and the PA-PLO's own dynamic. Putting myself in Israel's position for a moment of this Israeli government, you see an ever-expanding path towards growing delegitimization spreading Jewish communal divisions in the diaspora, and a genuine demographic and political dilemma on the ground. How do you preserve the Jewish state when you're spread between and amongst roughly four Palestinians? And for the moment as well, if I'm Bibi Netanyahu, Iran certainly looms large, not just for the day when, but for the day after whatever happens is going to happen. Because if you want the world to support you on the day after you do what you have to do, the key, the key, I think, that Bibi has come to realize lies in a potential movement with the Palestinians. Palestine, if you want, for Netanyahu, has become the key to Tehran. But for Ramallah, the road ahead is also very uncertain. This leadership's slender national credentials hang by a thread. There's no visible alternative to them, but they still represent the very last breeze from the Palestinian national movement's winds of the 60s. The national project, so-called of 1988, which is to build a state for Palestinians on this territories occupied in 1967, is still at the PLO's shaky core. And all talk of UN unilateral action, notwithstanding, the PLO leadership today, which is wedded to a negotiated solution, has little option of divorce from it. So what about a two-state solution? A two-state solution is not a new invention. It is a very respectable 76-year-old Peel. Lord Peel in 1937 was the first proposed two-state solution. It was, of course, tried in 1947 again. It was manif manifestly unacceptable from the Arab point of view then. Uh, this is not the place to debate it. But it only really sprung back to life after the PLO adopted it unilaterally in 1988. Indeed, the much maligned Yasser Arafat is today the father of the latter-day two-state solution. It seems to have been forgotten by all those who are adamantly supporting it today that it was adamantly opposed yesterday by the US and Israel for almost a decade. Even in 1999, just before Camp David, Mr. Barak, the leader of the Labour Party in Israel, 
refused to include the two-state solution on the Labour Party electoral program. It was not until 2003, paradoxically, that it was adopted by Israel, and not until by Sharon, and not until 2009 that Bibi was converted to it. But nonetheless, it is today the only vehicle that is the common ground between all parties to the conflict, Israel, Palestine, and Arab, even Hamas does not oppose in principle, and it would take a massive political earthquake to shift this cumbersome ship from its course. The fact is that there's no real plan B. There's no negotiable solution. There are many other options, but if we're talking about negotiations, there is no negotiable solution to a two, uh, alternative to a two-state solution. The practical alternatives are unacceptable to one or both parties. An interim or provisional state or uh, process on the one end, or a one-state solution on the other. And in between, the whole range of unilateral actions that will only involve, at best, a partial and temporary solution. I do not want, for the moment, to dispute the difficulties of reaching a fair and sustainable two-state solution. There is no doubt about the narrowing window that Secretary of State Kerry spoke of earlier this year at his confirmation hearings in Congress. I personally came to this conclusion many years ago. How does one shift 500,000 settlers out of the West Bank? How does one divide Jerusalem in a way that's workable? How do you get the Israelis out of the Jordan Valley after Bibi Netanyahu has told uh, Abbas that he wants to stay there for 30 years? How do you ensure Palestinian security against future threat? How do you resolve the refugee problem and address the issue of a Jewish state? The problems of negotiating have to do with signing, ratifying, implementing, verifying, and then sustaining. Signing, ratifying, implementing, verifying, and sustaining. And these are immense. The first, that of negotiating, is just the very, very first hurdle. In spite of all of this, I believe that the prospects of actually reaching an agreement today are not negligible. And we should be prepared not because the parties have suddenly turned to peacemongering, if there's such a thing, but because the short to medium term, every, in the short to medium term, every other alternative looks worse to one or both sides. And this is not about optimism or pessimism. It's about reading which way the compass, which direction the compass is pointing. A catastrophic failure of the talks, however, could lead, should lead to a rethink. And again, this is not necessarily new. I've been recently involved in a five-year-old project now called the Parallel State Project, which uh, is just about, the book's just about to be published by, um, I think, California University Press, edited by uh, Mark Levine and Matthias Mossberg, which is a very interesting idea. The idea is that you take the whole of mandatory Palestine and you have two states, so one so. So superimposed, sorry, superimposed over the other. So that, for instance, all the Jews in the land would vote in one parliament, all the Arabs would vote in another, and you could see how this may or may not work. Um, and uh, it is indeed, as a matter of principle, very, very hard to, 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 to argue against the notion of a one state. Uh, Ian Listick makes a very good case, not necessarily for the one state as a virtue, but the one state as a possible outcome. But I would say that it's very hard to dispute the vision of a civic state with one man, one vote, in which everyone can live wherever they want in the whole of mandatory Palestine. I think we can distinguish between three forms of one state, and I think one has already been very clearly made, which is the one state reality. This is not just a reality of today, it's a reality since 1967. This is the apartheid state, the one that we have today. It is a de facto consequence of occupation, 
and its prevailing characteristics are Israeli domination and oppression of the Palestinian people. The second is one state as a desirable outcome. The question here is how? This, to my mind, is not something that you can negotiate, at least not in the short term. How will the Jewish majority that is in control of every aspect of their life hand over, transfer power to a Palestinian, either similar number of Palestinians or even a Palestinian majority? In many ways, this is very similar to the predicament that the Palestinians found themselves before 1948. I do not see any mobilizable partners to such a project in the short to medium term. The second is that something may arise not out of a rational strategy, but out of the convergence of some unseen and unknowns. Something may happen. But I believe we cannot base politics on maybes or on unseen aspirations. This is neither good strategy nor very good analysis. And as someone who's not unsympathetic to the vision of a one state, there are other enormous problems. Jeremy, I think, has mentioned some of them. Jewish fears of Arab domination, potential deadly competition over land and resources, the issue of Jewish technical and institutional domination, the emergence of a marginalized Arab underclass in a largely Jewish-run state, We've seen all of this before during the one state of the mandate. And furthermore, the region is not providing a perfect model of harmony and communal existence for one to draw on. I believe that the one state, two state dichotomy is to some extent false. The two are not necessarily exclusive. One state could eventually arise as the result of two states. And this for me could be a very likely outcome a consensual new regime in mandatory Palestine, born out of enlightened self-interest and after the conflict has been diffused. And this is where the European model becomes relevant. It only took a very few years from the end of World War II to the beginnings of the EU. For the one statist, the real challenge is to operationalize within a real time frame and a pragmatic political context. How, in essence, do you get Israel to de-Zionize itself in an era of ethnic and religious retrenchment, and at a point where Israel's Jewish population is becoming more nationalist, more religious, more Jewish than Israeli, if you like? Ovadia used his 500,000 mourners yesterday attest to this. But the one-state, two-state dichotomy is not the only consequence. Other things may move as well. The worst case is a descent into intercommunal violence that is now all too common across the region. If Sunni can slaughter Shiite, Arab and Jew within and across the Green Line are perfectly capable of following suit. A more hopeful scenario is one where the Palestinians retrench and reconnect in peaceful pursuit of their three primary national aims, full civil rights in Israel, end of occupation of the territories occupied in 1967, and a fair, just, and justifiable deal for the 1948 refugees, a struggle in which the precise form of national statehood takes second place to other goals. Thank you.